the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton. Every week, bringing you an outstanding business communicator. I know, as you do, that communication, communication skills are key to your company's leadership, management, customer service, sales, teamwork, morale, and yes, profits. And so every week, I have a conversation which you benefit from with someone who has reached the pinnacles of business through their communication skills. Today, our guest is someone that I've known and admired for several decades, Alex Gregory, chairman and CEO of YKK Corporation of America. We met when I was vice, vice president of Georgia College in Milledgeville, Georgia. Alex was starting his burgeoning career, had already moved along to management levels at YKK, then based in Macon, Georgia. We have kept in touch since then. I've watched his progress to become an international leader, and you will benefit greatly, as I will, from hearing Alex Gregory today. Alex, welcome to the Biz Communication Show. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for that very generous introduction. Well, I could spend 20 minutes introducing you, but 20 minutes is all we have. So we need to hear more from you instead of me. Alex, as I look back on your career and you try to trace how someone became such an effective leader, one of the factors I noticed was that you spent three years in the Navy before you began your business career. I'm wondering in what way did this prepare you to become a corporate leader? What were some of the experiences you had and some of the factors that you learned that got you ready for a leadership position? Wow, that goes, that goes back a long way, several decades, as, as you mentioned. Uh, Bill, I would say that my experience both at Georgia Tech and in the Navy, and then later going to graduate school, they all impacted me uh, in a very significant way, uh, primarily in just the self-discipline and planning and preparation and hard work. Uh, I know at Georgia Tech and in the Navy, it was very important that I thought through my daily schedule and where I was going and what uniforms I needed to take with me and, and how to make sure that I didn't leave something out that was important. And I've carried a lot of those things forward with me into the business world in terms of the planning and preparation. So I would think those would be the keys. It's, it's, it's hard for me even now to sit down and relax on a Sunday afternoon uh, without doing something productive, you know? So these, these, it, it did have an impact that way. Well, you've told me your, your daily schedule, as I remember you get up at something like four or 4.30 every day. Well, that's, that's part of the story too. I, I learned early on that I was most productive in the morning. So it just kept getting earlier and earlier over time. So yeah, I got up at four and I, I, walk my dogs and drive to the fitness center and then shower. And then I try to be at my desk around six from six to eight are probably my most productive hours. And Atlanta being at your desk at six is wise also for beating traffic, isn't it? I must say that's one of my motivating factors also. Yes. To beat the traffic, at least on one end of the day. You have kept your connection with the Navy. I noticed that you were in the Naval Reserve for 28 years. I was uh, a total of 28 years, three years, three years active and 25 uh, in the reserves. And I have to say, a couple of years ago, I was invited down to speak on a Thursday session to the NROTC students at Georgia Tech. And that was quite a homecoming for me to be back there with them. And I enjoyed that very much. I have, I take great pride in that part of my, my history. Switching now to your management theory and practice. A couple of years ago, you gave me a book that quoted you. The book quoted focused on humility. And in the book, you talked some about how important it is for 
a CEO, a manager, a supervisor, anyone who's leading a group to have genuine humility. What exactly is genuine humility and what are the benefits to the group when the leader exhibits that? Uh, I'm not sure that I'm an expert or qualified to, to provide the answer to those questions, but I certainly can speak from my personal experiences. And I think I was very fortunate to very early in my career, right after I got out of the Navy, to, to join a company like YKK that was very and is very philosophically based. Uh, our corporate philosophy is the cycle of goodness. No one prospers without rendering benefit to others. And the way I interpret that after you know, more than 40 years of being around it is, uh, is that in every decision that we make, we think about that decision's impact on, on our customers, of course, but also our employees and the communities where we work. And when you start off with that philosophy and you try to live that philosophy and try to recruit and retain people who share that philosophy, uh, it helps one to become, I guess the, the modern term, term is a servant leader. I was not aware of that term back when, when that book was being written, or I'm sure I would have used it because I've since connected with some folks down at Georgia Tech and, uh, and they have a class there in servant leadership. And it's been, I don't take the class, but they do allow me to come down and speak to it sometimes. And I see that what we practice here at YKK is part of our philosophy and our core values. Is what they would call servant leadership, putting others first. I uh, noticed, of course, as I was thinking about our conversation today, I noticed this little item that you gave me when you and I shared a very pleasant lunch a couple of months ago. And this gets back to what you're talking about, your cycle of goodness. And not only do you have your three core values, but you came up, your company came up with the 25 fundamental behaviors which encapsulate this. Now, first of all, what was the process you went through? You didn't just have a PR firm <laughs> produce this for you. What, what was the discussion process that you came up that you went through to come up with these 25. Thank you, Bill, for allowing me to talk about that. Uh, we call these our 25 fundamental behaviors. And I have to back up a little bit and say for, for more than 10 years, we have been speaking with our employees and having workshops to talk about our philosophy and our three core values. And as you can imagine, talking about those limited subject, very broad in scope, but in words, you know, very vague at some points. Uh, we could tell that some of our employees needed a little more meat. They heard the nouns, but they needed some verbs. How do I, how do I take that philosophy and use it in this decision that I have to make? Uh, we often talk about business is not so much black and white. There's a lot of gray there. And so they needed something to fall back on there. Last October, I heard a gentleman speak at a Vistage meeting I was attending. His, his name is David Friedman, and I have to give him credit for this. He did it in his own company, and he sold his own company in 2008, and now, now he goes around and helps other companies come up with their fundamental behaviors. So we engaged him to meet with our senior leadership to come up with 25 fundamental behaviors that we think if we and all of our employees practice on a daily basis, that that will help to instill the or to drive the corporate culture we desire. Uh, it's based on a principle that the leaders drive the values, the values drive the behaviors, and hopefully those behaviors will drive the corporate culture. So when I discussed this with our leadership team, everyone got very excited because this was what we needed next. This was something we could talk about and we could gauge our, engage our employees in that. And so every week we begin the week with, uh, with a message from me explaining what that week's fundamental behavior means to me. And then we, in every meeting that we have for that entire week, we devote two or three minutes to talking about that week's fundamental behavior. And I have to say that the response, we're in week 15 now, and I have to say the response has been very positive. I'm very excited. This is something we decided to do in the North and Central America region. 
which is 12 companies from Canada to Colombia. And there are five other regions for YKK. And uh, so we, I think the word would be courageously move forward with this. And uh, later when I presented it to the leadership in Japan, they were very interested also. And now just today we received uh, an email from a, another division, another area of the, con of the company asking us if they could use the same concept in, in their region also. So we're very excited. Who is this distributed to uh, your 25 fundamental behaviors, this attractive item? I, I would assume every employee has this. I would, I would answer that question by saying every employee has a copy of it, plus everyone I meet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As, 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 as happened to you, I, I, I have a tendency to pull it out of my pocket and start it's well, well worth sharing. It's compact and, and easy to carry and distribute. One of the things that I admire so much, and I've dealt with many CEOs across my career in management and my career now as a consultant. And one of the things I admire so much about how this evolved is that this was not a top-down directive. This was not, here are the 25 fundamental behaviors. Here are the three core values. No, this was truly a work of widespread consensus, right? That, that is correct. That is correct. Now, uh, let me make one little distinction there. When we did the core values, when YKK globally came up with the core values, they asked 20, 15, I'm sorry, they asked 15,000 employees for input into that. So when we were talking with David about our approach to the fundamental behaviors, that would have been our logical approach to it. But he said in this instance, he suggested something different. And that is that we, ha we have a meeting of the senior management. We had 22 people in senior management get together and develop the 25. And then we had discussions with our HR people and a number of other employees to make sure that what we had come up with was consistent with our core values and our philosophy. And so far, there's been nothing but uh, positive responses to them. Let's talk about a couple of those fundamental behaviors. One, listen to understand. Talk about that one, please. It's, it's funny you selected that one. That is number 15. That was the fundamental behavior for this week. And when I wrote my, when I wrote my message, I, I used a different approach. Normally I say, okay, here are my thoughts about, here are my thoughts to everyone about the fundamental behavior for this week. But when I wrote this one, I started off, I said, I'm gonna change the pattern this week. Normally I write to everyone. This week I'm writing to only you. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted everyone to realize that we all can be better listeners and uh, we have to learn skills to listen effectively. And so in, in my message to them, I pointed, pointed out the things that I find myself doing, uh, which might include thinking about what I'm gonna say rather than listening to what you're saying, or thinking in terms of, wow, Bill, you think, you think that's something, wait till you hear what I can say to top that. And so I encouraged everyone to be aware of those uh, dysfunctional behaviors and to work on developing their skills to be more effective listeners. We, we can all improve on that. I know when you and I shared a very congenial lunch together two or three months ago, we talked about Stephen Covey's chapter five, where he said, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And you and I recognize, and most people recognize, that that's not our natural tendency. Our natural tendency is to, hey, here's the way it is, or you're wrong and I'm right. And I'm, I'm, you're not even worth listening to. We may not say those words, but we sometimes give that impression. In fact, you and I talked about Stephen Covey saying that most people aren't listening. Most people are just waiting for their turn to talk. And, and I'll listen as you respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. You're exactly right. And I was given advice a long time ago, and uh, I might overdo it, but the advice to me was before I can speak my own thought, 
first I have to convey the message that I have understood what they said. I have to, I have to repeat something they said, or at least say, yes, I agree. That's a very good point. I have to acknowledge that before I'm allowed to speak my own ideas. This is so important in all relationships, personal as well as business. I remember I was directing a communication seminar in my home state of Mississippi for a group of attorneys. And one of the attorneys during the discussion raised his hand and said, we were on the topic of listening. He said, Bill, I've been uh, involved as an attorney in at least 500 divorce cases. And he said in every one of them, either one or both of the parties said he or she does not listen to me. And of course, in the parent and child and in friendships and in meeting people, listening is an absolute key. I, I totally agree. And you said, something, you said something else that triggered a thought for me. As I said, we have these fundamental behavior booklets that we give to all of our employees and we... I knocked my mic off, sorry. We have them in French and Spanish for our uh, colleagues in Canada and throughout Latin America and the northern part of South America. And recently we had someone approach us in, in one of those operations and said, do you mind if I take this home with me and share it with an organization I belong to? I think it was his church. But uh, as you said, we can take these skills and use them in, in all of our relationships. Another one of the fundamental behaviors I would appreciate your explaining for us, provide meaningful appreciation. Yes, and, and that was last week's uh, message and last week's fundamental behavior that we discussed. I think we divide people into two, we can divide people into two major categories. One is those people who think why should I tell someone thank you for doing something that they should have done anyway? And we've all worked around people that fit into that category. And what I encourage people to do is not be part of that category, but rather look for opportunities to show appreciation. And uh, I, you know, often it's just a matter of speaking to someone and telling them how much you appreciate them. Uh, but I also suggested maybe they would consider writing notes and sending a, a note, a personal note to someone. I try to do that uh, as often as I can, and I find I find it uh, it meets with very good response. One time, I attended a little seminar. I spoke on a panel, and then that afternoon, I flew to Los Angeles and then to Japan. And so, knowing that I was going to be on the plane, I grabbed some of these thank you notes, and I wrote a little note to everyone that I'd met at that seminar. And I don't know I don't know why, but for some reason, after that. Everywhere I'd go, people would talk about Alex's note that he wrote on the plane headed for Los Angeles. But just a little bit of effort yields uh, very, very good results. One, one last story there. Last week uh, or two weeks ago, one of our dear colleagues in Macon passed away, Donald Bauer. He was our uh, technical engineering trainer for, for across many disciplines for the entire region. And, and and as I was talking with someone, the day after that, we had a meeting and we were talking about Donald. And I remembered that earlier this year, uh, I was signing his length of certificate, his, his certificate of his length of service for 40 years. And I remember writing on there how much I appreciated him and all he had done. And so it occurred to me how lucky I was to have had that opportunity to, to put it in writing so that he could show it with his family. And then I wondered, gosh, did he even receive that yet? And so I, I met with Lee Smith, who's our vice president of manufacturing operations in Macon. I said, Lee, did Donald get his length of service certificate? And he said, yes. He said, normally I wait till the end of the year, but this year for some reason I divided it into two halves and Donald was in the first half and he already got his. So my concluding message that I wrote was, don't wait too long to show your appreciation. That was providential. Yeah, I think so. It really seems that. You're a golfer and you know golf pros, at least we know them by name. And I want to tell you very quickly, I was playing golf with uh, a really wonderful golfer. I belonged in the group only out of friendship. <laughs> I, I knew that this golfer had played in a number of pro-ams with PGA professionals. 
It was a natural question when I said to him, Jim, you've played with a lot of PGA Tour professionals. Which one do you remember the most as the most affable, the, the one you enjoyed? He said, well, oddly enough, Bill, it's one I did not get to play with. I said, well, explain that to me. He said, I was supposed to play in the Honda Classic Pro-Am with Corey Pavin. And he said, unfortunately, Corey got an intestinal infection the night before and had to cancel. So we played with another golfer instead. He said, I never gave that much of a thought until a week later, I had a handwritten message from Corey Pavin saying, I'm very sorry that I was ill and could not get to meet you and play with you. Isn't that a treasure? That is a treasure. And, and that gives you a glimpse into his character, doesn't it? It really does. You are going to, I hope, uh, appear with us again a couple of months down the line. I know you're heading in some different directions and cutting back on some things, but I hope you will be back on the Biz Communications show. Before we end this program, though, I want to say, as I've told you, I want to share with the audience that I've had the opportunity to hear you speak several times once at the Terry College of Business third Thursday, where I remember your title was appropriately, Zippers and More. <laughs> and I recognized every time I heard you that I've heard many corporate leaders. I've had the opportunity to coach some on their presentation skills. The two best ones I've ever heard are Cat Cole, the uh, I knew her when she was the CEO of Cinnabon. Now she's head of Focus Brands. I heard her speak and met her afterwards. You, Alex, are the, in that top duo I've ever heard. And as a speech coach, I need to conclude today with, by asking, what is it that prepared you to become an outstanding communicator? You couldn't be an international corporate leader if you weren't. So what prepared you for that? And maybe what would be a tip that you would give people that could improve their presentations? I, I won't waste your time or your audience's time disclaiming everything you just said about me. I'll just say thank you. Thank you for putting me in such special category there. Uh, for me, Bill, you've heard me give my one speech, really, and it's to talk about YKK and to tell our story. Uh, I find that very comfortable and, and I'm very happy and passionate about doing it. Uh, we've come through so much. If, if you knew our industry better and what we've gone through in the last 20 years with uh, so much apparel production moving offshore, the other half of that speech was zippers and so much more, but adapting through innovation was the last half of that speech. And it's how our team has sought new opportunities to put our products into automobiles and safety products and working with the government on some of their many different products and the pride that I have in all of our employees for what they've done. Anyway, getting back to the point, it's easy for me to talk about those things. If you ask me to speak on some other subject, I, I have no doubt that your opinion of my abilities would be different, but anyway, it's just, subject knowledge, and it's just something I, I, I really love. I love this company, and I love our employees. That comes across very clearly. So really, I believe you're saying what I certainly encourage people to do, talk about what you know, and talk about what you're passionate about. I totally agree. Alex, this has been a tremendous privilege to have you as our guest on the Biz Communication Show. I know that there are those who would love to follow up, get in touch with you. What contact information would you like to share with us? Well, thank you. I'd love to hear from them. Uh, probably the easiest is if, if I just share my email address, and that would be alexgregory at ykk-usa.com. And it's Alex Gregory, no periods, no punctuation, just A-L-E-X-G-R-E-G-O-R-Y. Alex Gregory at ykk-usa.com.
Thank you, Alex. And one thing I will say is if they get an email from you, they're going to see one of those fundamental behaviors, the one that's prominent that week, they will see that listed in your email. That is correct. We're very proud of that process too. Thank you. And now that Alex has given his contact information, I'm pleased to share mine. I'm Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy. Additionally, you can sign up for my newsletter, my blog, and also subscribe to the podcast. This program is Biz Communication Show is not only on video, it's on podcast as well. Thank you so much for being with us. Alec Gregory, thank you again, my friend. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure. And be with us next week when we'll have another outstanding corporate leader who excels in communication and will share their tips and strategies with us.